Interesting. Okay, so we're just getting started. I don't see anybody watching yet. That's odd. Oh, there's six people. Okay, cool. All right. So for anyone joining, we're just going to do the normal audio alignment thing before we actually get to the podcast proper. So you'll see us clap our hands. But if you haven't already seen it in the last one. So all right, I'll go first. I'm just doing a backup recording starting it now. I'm good. Just do mine. And there we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So hello and welcome to Enterprise Linux Security, episode 57. We're going to talk about DOS, but not the operating system, distributed denial of service attacks, or DDoS, which we've covered before, but we have a really interesting story at the center of why we're talking about this and figured it might be a good chance to just do a refresher anyway. How you doing, Zhao? All good. As always, a pleasure to be here with you, Jay. And yeah, we had a bit of a, a denial of service right at the start on our end, and we got yeah. through it. <laughs> yeah, um, I denied <laughs> service because I was I would just lost track of time. And um, for those of of you that are curious, <laughs> I don't mind telling people why it, it's um, you know, OpenShift and OpenStack are a lot of fun, but it's also you know, it takes some time. If if anyone who's worked with those technologies, uh, if they have, they know what I'm talking about. But you know what? We're here, and it's time to do a podcast. I'm excited, so uh, let's get into it. Yeah, so we're talking about denial of service. Like you said, we already covered this in the past, but um, recently Cloudflare just uh, came out with some information about um, an attack that they had stopped. And yeah, the numbers are just staggering. 73 million requests per second. That's that is... absurd. <laughs> craziness yeah um to give you some idea of how how big this was the previous largest one had been reported by google in august and it had happened in Ju june 1st of last year it was 43 million requests per second so this one is almost double that and again 43 million requests per second even that is just absurd so yeah we'll be talking I'm a bit about this quantify just the the computing power behind that as we were kind of talking about earlier like um that's a lot of requests and i would think it would take a fraction of that to bring down the average web server let alone i mean obviously this probably wasn't just one web server as the target because a lot of times and even as an article we're going to link to alludes to it mentions that there's often denial of service as a service so um yeah that's a lot by any stretch yeah so I thought it would be better if we give people a refresher of the different types of the denial of service that can happen. It's not just about the request. It's not just about the bandwidth. And those are two different things. Um, and again, there are many ways that you can cause a denial of service. It can be something as dumb as someone walking into the server room, as we always say, and just tripping on a cable or something like that. And you're literally denying your users the service. So that's a yeah. denial of service it's dumb enough but it's a denial of service anyway um but um but yeah the interesting thing here and actually one of the the many interesting aspects here to quantify this you have to to realize that 73 million requests per second and blocking something of that magnitude means that you actually have to open the packets and look at the requests and mark them as being malicious or being part of the attack. That means terminating the, the encrypted connection because websites today use HTTPS. So if you want to look at the packet, you have to end the, the encrypted connection at the firewall or at the load balancer or somewhere where you're going to inspect the traffic. Um, if you recall, to finish um, an encrypted connection, a TLS connection, there's an en a handshake that has to happen. That means that you have to go back and forth between the sender and the receiver a couple of times to finish that handshake. So to inspect 73 million requests, you have to do that handshake 73 million times. So just there, it's three times that just in packets going back and forth the network. We're not even looking at the size of the packets. It's just the, the number, the sheer number of packets every single second while the attack is happening. It's massive. 
Google actually, last year when they came out with information about their attack, they actually explained that they rely on something called HTTP pipelining, which is a, a part of the HTTP 1.1 protocol that lets you reuse the connection so that you don't have to go through all of these steps of going packets, of sending packets back and forth to be able to analyze that. This is something really interesting and it's one of those tricks that lets you handle traffic at this scale. And again, it's the type of things that you wouldn't normally consider or go deliberately looking for if you're just dealing with low traffic websites or something like that. But when you reach the scale that these guys are operating at, then you most definitely need to optimize like this. That's that's just crazy to me, the, the magnitude of these. And uh, it's, and the article mentions this, it's one of those things that, um, well, I guess there's just no easy way to mitigate this because, I mean, it, it's easy to say, block it. What's the problem? You know, someone doesn't know how these things work. Well, if it was that easy, trust me, there would be no problem and there'd be no incentive to do it. It's it's definitely not that easy. That's why there, there's a problem here. And it's according to the article, it's just getting more and more common. Obviously, that's the case because we have a record breaking or some record breaking numbers here that Cloudflare is seeing. And, and even if you take all of our advice and let's just say, I don't know, someone just doesn't even figure out how to break into your servers. So that's great. No one no one broke in. But but even then, that doesn't mean you're going to be online. Obviously, your Internet provider could could uh, fail. But even even without that, you could just be minding your own business. No one breaks in and you're still down. Right. And it's not even something on the inside that caused it. It's not your fault. It's just someone on the outside decided to deny service to your users effectively. That's actually one of the special things about this type of attack. Nobody has to get into your network. You don't have to be breached. There's no vulnerability that has to be exploited for it to happen. Somebody right. just either throws a lot of requests or weirdly crafted requests at you or a lot of bandwidth at you, and now you're in trouble. And like you said, it's not just a matter of blocking it because the traffic has to go through a lot of, hop of hoops to go from the client to reach you. It has to go through lots of different networks. In the end, you might end up blocking the traffic when it reaches you, but it has already gone through all of those hoops and it might be blocking something else along the way. So even if you're not receiving the, tra the traffic on your servers, you're cutting it at uh, the perimeter, you, there might still be issues with uh, customers reaching your services if the networks in the... In, I mean, and up until you reach the your network are congested. So it's not just about you when something like this happens. Right, right. Yeah, no, totally. And some of sometimes it's extortion. I mean, even the article near the beginning mentioned uh, that they did not feel that this situation had anything to do with the Super Bowl. But the reason why they were thinking that it might, or other people might have been thinking that, obviously, you know, causation. But sometimes that's how this happens. It would be a shame if something happened to your website on your big day with that that awesome game that everyone seems to like. It'd be a shame if nobody could uh, access the website. But if you give us some money, maybe we'll maybe make sure that doesn't happen. And everybody <laughs> knows what that means. And I know I'm being silly about how that dialogue goes, but it's actually not that different than how I just mentioned. That does happen. And again, if the attack reaches your network, maybe your firewall is able to handle it and you block it at the firewall level but maybe the firewall isn't able to, hunt, to handle that load. Maybe the web server might have the capacity to filter the requests itself, but then the routers in between, the network switches in between may not be able to sustain the load. So there are many different things that can go actually wrong here. There are many things that might not be able to go. Uh, it can be as, as tricky and I've seen this happen. You might trip your circuit breakers. It might go as far as sustaining a DOS, a DDoS attack, and your power delivery circuit not being able to sustain all of your servers running at top capacity for the, that amount of time. It might not be able to deliver the amount of voltage, or it might just overheat and trip the, the breakers at some point. And again, DOS, yeah. denial of service, and not necessarily at the system level something just in the infrastructure not being able to sustain it yeah and it's it's not an issue where you could that you could solve by changing dns you have a company domain it, it points to your website 
and as soon as you move that domain to another server that's not being you know hit it's hit because it follows the domain they're attacking the domain so when you think of the normal things we do like spin up another server have a backup server a warm site cold site all those different things it doesn't matter because as soon as you spin it up and update dns to point to that other data center it doesn't matter because like we mentioned earlier, it has nothing to do with your data center. That's not even a factor in this. You have a domain, yeah. you have a web presence, that's it. That's the only thing. Yeah, absolutely. To give you an idea of this, to obviously to you and the, the audience, um, Google actually provided a bit more of details on their on their post on, on August. Um, they actually identified 5,256 different IP addresses as sources for their attack from 132 countries. So this was a relatively small botnet in the grand scheme of things. There are botnets out there that go in the thousands, hundreds of thousands of servers and hundreds of thousands of workstations that are compromised. So this one wasn't even that large, the one that uh, attacked uh, Google. Um, I imagine that the one that uh, attacked Cloudflare this time was even bigger than that. and. Again, as network connections get better and people get higher bandwidth at home and all of that, that's all a factor that uh, that factors when something like this happens because all of that will be abused to attack someone. And yeah, it's <laughs> it's not one malicious actor that would be just a single DOS, but a distributed one when you have thousands of attackers, when you have thousands of connections reaching your systems, that's when things get hairy and people start to, to have cold sweats in the data center. Especially when it's time to either go on vacation or a holiday is coming up. You know, that's a, usually when this happens, it's just Murphy's Law of Computing, I guess. Or when it happens in the during the weekend, for example, when you don't have all the team at work. Uh, yeah. yeah, these things get targeted at specific times precisely to take advantage of that. Um, and... Uh, it's not just about completely of making sure that the service is knocked out. It might just simply degrade the performance of the service. Um, the, the server might still reply to some requests or might partially reply to some requests. For example, you try to load a web page and you only get a couple of images or you might just get a part of the text or something like that while the server is being attacked. There are many different things that can happen during a, a DDoS attack. It all depends on how the web page is constructed, how the code behind it operates when it's under stress. And it's something that is really hard to, to test properly because you cannot replicate conditions like this easily. You, again, when we've said this in the past, you can test your web server against multiple connections. You can throw applications that simulate connections at it. It will never be quite the same thing as the real thing. So, Again, your mileage may vary, but it's really tricky to, to replicate a situation like this. And it's not to say that there's absolutely nothing you can do. There's things you could do that might help. The percentage of success is probably not very high, but um, the article does go into some things that uh, Cloudflare recommends that you consider. Um, and it, just as a disclaimer, Cloudflare is not a sponsor. I've literally never spoken to them before, but considering their presence on the internet and uh, their involvement with preventing these kinds of things, because that's what they're known for, it's pretty much impossible, I think, to talk about uh, denial of service attacks without mentioning Cloudflare. Yeah, the, they're so massive. Their presence is so massive that they can probably look at both ends of the connection. They probably have a presence in the ISP of the where the bot is running, and they have a presence in your website because they're filtering the traffic that reaches it. So they're ideally positioned to, to apply some protection in a case like this. Um, yep. What they mentioned there on the, on the article, that the DOS as a service is a sync, just piles up on top of all the other as a service that we've mentioned in the past, ransomware and hackers as a service and all of that. Um, it's look, it looks like this is becoming more and more commoditized. So you need the, the, the OS somewhere, you just buy it off the shelf. You pay somebody 30 bucks a month and you can use their botnet, for example, for a few hours or a few minutes. And that's yep. enough to cripple a company's website or a company system. Just take them down for a few hours and they're effectively out of business during that time. So that's a deliberate material loss that they're going to experience because of the attack. 
Yeah, it, it, you know, the numbers are obviously very surprising. I mean, this is a massive, uh, you know, amount of data that they detected here. That part is surprising. What is not surprising to me in particular is when they mention that um, they're seeing a lot of cloud providers as the origin point for some of these. And it doesn't necessarily, it does, it does not mean Cloudflare, I mean, it doesn't mean cloud companies are behind this and causing problems. Um, what it means is that there's a shared responsibility model and anyone who works in cloud knows exactly what I'm talking about, where they provide you the server and the you know data center that it runs in, or they don't provide the data center, but they give you access to a server that runs in the data center, but it's still up to you to secure it. You have to install the updates. You have to keep it, keep it going. Um, if someone is able to get into the server, you know, you have to fix it unless you have some kind of a managed service agreement. But most of the time, um, that's the, the rule. But a lot of people don't really understand that. They see it as a service. They take care of it. They're the company that hosts my website. I don't care. And they don't think any further than that. So having cloud providers as the source of this doesn't surprise me because of that reason. But I like the fact that what they mentioned in the article, and I think this is pretty cool, is coming up with a free notification system when the address space that a cloud provider owns is shown as having some kind of a um, attack like this happen. Mm -hmm. And that and making that a free service to companies, I think is very, very great because I mean, this information should be free in my opinion. If you, if you need the information, if it can help, mitigate this, I think that's great because then it lets the, the cloud providers know, hey, someone on your network didn't install their update last week or something. Yeah. That's absolutely true. But unfortunately, that's only part of the the problem with cloud providers and cloud hosters. Um, while it is true that it's a shared responsibility responsibility model and you need to update and patch your systems, that's just the basic. We've mentioned that before as well, multiple times. Mm -hmm. There is also the fact that it's relatively cheap to, to get the, um, the basic VM or the basic system running on the cloud. You pay pennies on a dollar to have a system running for a bit. And you won't need too much CPU, you won't need too much RAM, you won't. Ne you might need some bandwidth, but the cost that it, that it takes you to, to get that and run a few hundred VMs in a cloud provider somewhere is not necessarily that much. And you could start the, an attack with those as part of your botnet. So it's not necessarily that the, the instances were hacked or somebody got into your systems because they were unpatched. And that happens. Right. We know that yeah. happens yeah. a lot. Somebody might just have some financing or something that will let them pay for this normally and legally and use those systems in as part of an attack like this. That's also that's something a very that, good point. That's also something that, that should be considered. And the feed that they provide might help with that as well, because it will identify the systems originating this so that they can be cut at the, the origin network rather than go through all of those network hoops that we've mentioned so that they don't disrupt networks along the way. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting um, contribution that they are that they are giving with that with that thread fit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that resources are, are made available, at least options for people to consider if they want to explore the services that Cloudflare offers. I haven't personally used their services myself, so I really can't speak on the quality or anything. I have I mean, you could find your own reviews out there and see if, if you want to utilize their service, if this is something you think might be a problem for you, and it could be a problem for anyone. You never know. Um, we literally have people that could shut down a gaming service just because they, they're terrible at a game, right? And they rage quit and then DDoS the entire network. Uh, we see these types of things, and there's sometimes even kids take down networks. It's crazy. <laughs> Actually, that takes me back to the, the IRC years, like 20 years back, something like that, 25 years maybe. I better not think too much on that. But I remember a few people <laughs> talking that um, that they were losing at the game and they were chatting in IRC outside of the game and somebody offered, okay, I'll take out the other team's router or something like that so that you guys can score some points. And that was happening in real time. It's much more difficult to do that today, but still, that what you just described was something that actually really, truly happened. So, yeah, it, <laughs> again, not a hypothetical. <laughs> was that during or after the don't copy that floppy day? Or date or period. 
the shareware with Doom and all the fun stuff. Oh man, yeah, we could yeah. we could have a total oh, off absolutely. track episode if if we wanted to, but we can't. But man, it's fun to fun to reminisce. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So really large attacks. These guys measured their attacks in requests per second, and we're talking about millions of requests per second. There is a different uh, report of an attack on AWS in 2020 where they actually measured it in network bandwidth and they measured 2.7 terabits per second of traffic reaching their network and reaching a specific subset of websites that they were hosting. And while it's not comparable, um, network bandwidth with requests, because you don't know the actual packet size on these requests, um, it was still a massive amount of traffic to, to be generated three years ago. So, yeah. This doesn't shrink, so it will only keep getting bigger <laughs> over time. So you can imagine the amount of traffic that goes by the, the major network backbones, and part of it will be denial of service stuff. And every CPU has a limit. You know, I don't care how much you spent for it. You might it might last longer, right, until that happens, but it could still happen. And sometimes the limit isn't even the CPU. It's it's the number of workers that your web server software is allowing you to have that can answer those requests. And it it's yeah, it's a big problem. A lot of people deal with it, but how to solve it isn't so straightforward. And outside of um, some of the suggestions in this article. Um, among which, if I bring up the list, uh, they're mentioning things like managed DDoS rules, um, adaptive DDoS protection, rate limiting, firewall rules, you know, a lot of different things there that, uh, you know, network administrators, the system administrators can consider as an option. Um, but as much as I hate to say it, there are times where you just have to wait for it to stop. And, and <laughs> I wish that wasn't the case, but I have seen people that have been hit by this and they're just rolling their eyes like yeah let's they're doing the thing again i guess i have to wait it out it's, it's just so annoying yeah and it's just how it is um there are other things to consider for example if you develop applications in-house if you're developing your own websites for example for your company um pay attention to the code an improperly coded application can cause a denial of service by itself or can amplify a denial of service um, say, for example, a web server makes a request to the database each time it receives a request for a web page. If it's not properly created, uh, properly coded, if it's not reusing connections, you're not just receiving a connection each time an attacker tries to log into the website. You're also attacking yourself, attacking your own database server because the, the web page will try to connect to the database. So you're creating yourself denial of service because the database server might not be able to handle the load, even if the web server is. Um, so again, it's not just stuff from the outside. There's There are many, many different types of um, denial of service. There is also, for example, amplification denial of service. This was something that I became aware of when I dealt with um, a bind vulnerability a few years back, um, where you could trick bind into sending the reply to your query to a different IP address than the one that originated the request. So if you compile the list of 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 DNS servers, you could send a request to each one and ask for the reply to be sent to a target IP address. So though the attack would appear to be to be coming from those corrupt those DNS servers that were operating as they should, and they would generate the traffic on the target. So Again, multiple ways this can happen. It doesn't have to be specific target systems. Now imagine, for example, if the DNS servers were added to that threat feed list that Cloudflare has, they would be blocking DNS servers. They might break their own DNS servers because DNS uh, has a hi hierarchy and one of those could be the ones that were sending the request. So it's not just so simple to, to stop this. If it was, there would be no denial of service attacks. Right. There'd be no reason for them to waste their time. Now, there is one thing that isn't necessarily going to stop this problem if you implement it. In fact, it won't even cause an impact in it at all. But but uh, there's a reason for this. So the, the trick here is if anyone is using auto scaling, OK, if you're if you're using the cloud and you have auto scaling such that, you know, for those that aren't aware of what I'm talking about already, we covered this. 
But 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 short summary, you have a certain number of web servers, maybe two or three behind a load balancer, and maybe your company releases software, you have a big software release, and you have a setup that if the load gets too much for these servers, that another server will spin up and then you know handle the traffic. And then when the traffic dies down, the servers start to come down, and then you have a minimum number of servers. And the key here, you also have a setting for the maximum number of servers configure that okay i want everyone that does auto scaling make sure please that you put a limit you have to have a ceiling because imagine if you got hit by ddos attack and you're dealing with this and you're just answering your cto and ceo's questions and you know you have all this going on but but servers are constantly spinning up to handle the traffic they can't because even they will be overwhelmed Next thing you know, you have thousands of servers when you normally have five. I mean, your bill is going to be massive. So make sure you put a limit on that because you will see, you'll have the answer for that bill. <laughs> so if you just put that setting in right now before it becomes a problem. And if it's something that never helps you, well, then it only took you five minutes to do it. So I mentioned Bind before and another server that would actually let you launch an amplification attack were LDAP servers, both Active Directory and Open LDAP. You could ask the, the LDAP server for a query and have it return the, the reply to a different IP address. Again, same method, same vector. You were not the attacker. Your IP would never reach the target, but these servers would do the, the harm for you. Um, other situations where you can actually get yourself in trouble is when... I'm sure you've seen this before. The the websites that have these funny 404 pages when there's a URL right. that doesn't exist, they have these funny images or animations or something like that. That's a disproportionate response to a query. You just send him a URL and he sends back like a megabyte or two megabytes of data to you. Um, if you can have enough bots sending requests for enough URLs that don't exist, you'll overwhelm their bandwidth. And they got themselves mm, in trouble. Right. And they got right. themselves in trouble simply because they were not aware of this or they weren't conscious enough that it could be abused this way. Um, so, yeah, disproportionate responses. Say you send 10 bytes to a server. This is my request. I want this URL. And they send you back 100 times that. That's some place that can be attacked immediately. So pay right. attention to that when you're developing your websites and your applications. Um yeah, additionally, unintentional DDoS, that's bad. Yeah, an intentional DDoS, and you're doing the hacker's job for them. Um, another way that this can be used is they might not necessarily want to knock you out of, the, out of service. They might just want to get your applications in a weird state. Say, leave them crashed or leave them in a way that they can then abuse in some other form to gain and elevate privileges, for example. So the DDoS itself might not be the attack. It might just be a vector for a different attack to be launched. And what usually happens with DDoS is that your logging system will complain much, much earlier than your actual production systems. Um, it might be overwhelmed by all the messages that it has to record from all of the requests, so you will not get logging for the, the attack. Or it might be put in a state where it simply stops complaining about too many requests, or it just ignores them, or it starts complaining about everything. So you'll end up ignoring whatever your logging system is giving you, your alerting system is giving you. And right. in the middle, that can disguise a different attack. So somebody might sneak in while you're ignoring your logs or you're ignoring your alerts. That's a different way that the DOS can be used and abused. It's like movies coming to life because it's like, yeah, could you distract the guard for a few minutes, just do something insane while I just go over here and just yeah. kind of help myself. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just the digital version of that. Just distract them with this so we could do the other thing. And nobody's going to know the, the intent or what they're after, you know? So, yeah, never know. Especially because logging servers will actually have to write the log messages somewhere. And your I.O. is going to be much, much slower than 73 million requests per second. So... <laughs> Immediately, yeah. it's going to fail. Nobody <laughs> nobody has logging systems to sustain that. Uh, so it will immediately fail. And something might creep in while you're not logging. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many things to think about here. And the human factor always plays a role. Now, I don't care how technical the attack is. I don't care if it's your token attack that you see in the movies, but in the real world where they're actually, you know, 
not social engineering, but breaking in, using CVEs to their um, advantage, CVE chaining, um, lateral movement, all of that. Um, it's just, um, you know, it happens. But at the same time, it's just one of those things that is in the world. And unfortunately, we wish it didn't exist. But here we are and doing a podcast about uh, DOS. And we're not talking about the operating system as much as I wish I had a retro computer. We're talking about something terrible, something that is a and, hard problem to solve. And actually, it's pretty cheap to, to launch an attack like this. If you use the amplification methods, you don't pay a, a dime. You just need to compile a list of servers that can reflect your requests to your target. If you're using low-cost uh, free tires or trial periods or something like that in your cloud providers, you can get your VMs running and launch the attack from there. There are so many ways to to initiate an attack like this. It's not even funny for if you're trying to defend the network. Um, again, relatively cheap, relatively inexpensive, and can rack up huge amount in losses and in costs, like you mentioned before with your example of the no limits. <laughs> Imagine if an attacker found out that your company had that configured no limits on their requests so let's just flood them and we'll immediately cause them to lose money that's this right. is an attack that directly and immediately causes a financial loss and that can get very costly really quickly imagine the the millions of dollars that amazon would lose if they stopped being available for 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever the amount of losses in sales it's incredible it really and, is <laughs> And going back to the self-denial of service, of service, this doesn't have this doesn't even have to be malicious. For example, Black Friday sales, lots of oh. websites go down during that period simply because of the promotions that are done in that day. So it doesn't have to be malicious, but the, the end result is exactly the same. People try to access your service to open your website and they can't or for example, and here World of Warcraft is actually I famous for this. I was just about to mention an online game. Yeah. Beat me to it. Yeah. They're notoriously famous for this. They never dimensioned their server. They never sized them up properly. So whenever they launched a new expansion, everybody had to wait in queues for hours. Um, that's another yep. denial of service. Self-inflicted. And they didn't learn over, I don't know how many expansions they launched, but it happened in every single one. Always the same issue. Um, yeah, maybe I mean, someone should let them know about auto-scaling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I know it's not that simple before anyone writes in. I know that. <laughs> but still, I don't know if it's it, not. Um, when well, they started, they actually had the server per, per Okay, and this is going to date me, but way back in the day when they launched World of Warcraft, they actually had one server per instance, per realm. Uh, so they had like 40 servers, 50 servers in the US, 40 in Europe, and, and it goes like that. They couldn't exactly add more servers to each of the realms because they weren't prepared to, to scale like that. I sincerely hope that they have fixed that in the time since because yeah. Because, I mean, it's an easy fix. Um, but they hadn't done it at the time when they launched. So. Online games, even though you're right, um, they still often, not all of them, but will present it to the player as this is a server, you know, realm, whatever you want to call it. But they'll call it a server. What server do you want to go on? This server, they have that server. That one server could be a bunch of them. But they're to as not so, so as to not confuse people that aren't technical they don't care right but but there's a lot behind the scenes is more to my point but um i guess the the funny side of this which isn't really funny because it's leisure time if you want a 100 percent predictable or near 100 percent predictable um denial of service attack that often happens just look at an online game that's coming out uh just write down the the date in your calendar when the game debuts and you'll see a denial of service attack on release day and like you said people complaining about um not being able to join the server it still happens now i mean it was i think one of the final fantasy 14 expansions had that same issue happen recently so unfortunately it's still a problem as much as we hate it and then there are some interesting <laughs> some interesting types of attacks here and then going back to types of attacks again um a few years back, there was this attack, and you can look it up. It's an easy query. If you Google slow Loris, slow isn't mm. slow, and Loris, L-O-R-I-S. 
The idea of that was to cause the, the web server, specifically Apache, to be unresponsive because you were sending the requests really, really slowly. And really slowly, I mean one character at a time. And as yeah. long as that character, the next character, was sent within the TCP timeout uh, window, the connection wouldn't drop and Apache would patiently wait until you finished your request. And that meant that it would no longer be available to serve other requests. So if it had a, a low number of worker threads, you could actually starve an Apache server and make it be inaccessible. And you wouldn't use like one kilobyte per second of traffic on your end. So it was incredibly easy to do, incredibly easy to trigger. And it actually took a, a patch to, to fix that and you had to update um, to update Apache, and that was disruptive, obviously, because you're taking down the web server. But the attack right. was really amazing. The the out of the box experience that went there to to come up with an attack that way, it's really really amazing. I mean, the the thought process. I, okay, I'm trying to DOS the target, but I'm not going to overload it with requests or overload it with bandwidth or whatever. I'll just slowly ask for whatever I want to receive, and the the target system will wait. Is that similar or maybe the same thing technically as when you have um, a lot of open connections, like the handshake doesn't complete because they say, hey, I want to communicate with you, website. Oh, you do? What do you want to tell me? Nothing. And then another, and then another, then another. And then you have like a bunch of connections that were initiated with no payload, so to speak, and it's just being held open. Um, that's common as well. Uh, there's, yeah. there's a lot of different variations of this. That was actually a type of attack that was effective a few years back, but operating systems have smarted up about it and started Thankfully. to reduce the timeouts on the on the handshake precisely to try to avoid that situation because you could tie up the, the resources. There was a finite number of uh, connections that could be established and left half open. Actually, that's why I believe not Windows XP... Maybe Vista, I don't know. I think it was before 7. But in Windows, there was this really low value of half open connections, like 12 or something that you could have open, precisely to mm -hmm. avoid situations like that. They eventually had to raise that number and solve the problem differently. But it was because of, of attacks like that that would hog a, a server because too many connections were established but never completed. So, yeah. Same thing, yeah. denial of service, just a different method of reaching the, the denial there. there. There's one piece of advice I want to give everyone here. Um, it's preventative, but not preventing the DDoS part, because you really kind of can't. Um, you, you can make it harder, but anyway, um, educate your management team on what a DDoS attack is before there is one. Because there's two, if, if your management team isn't technically inclined, they might be upset if you can't make it stop. They, their mindset is, I'm paying you, you know, Mr. Mrs. Network Administrator, whatever the job title is, or security person to, to make things like this not happen. Um, I, I really do think you have to educate your people sooner because they have to understand that it's not easy to do. I don't care what your expertise is. There's going to be a situation that is just not straightforward to solve. And I think it's always a good idea to make sure your management team knows what a DDoS attack is. Um, it's kind of a hard thing to bring up because it's like, is there going to be a problem? Do you know something? No, no, no. It's, it's just a common thing. Look at this article, you know, or, or maybe even show them this article would be a good idea just so that they understand that this is not a straightforward thing to fix. So in a panic, they don't get upset. And uh, sometimes communication could be a preventative thing for other things related to something like this. This is probably one of the types of attacks that you can't really do much about it because, right. I mean, you can cut all the communications at the perimeter level, but like we mentioned before, if it hogs the, your ISP's network, if it gets flooded, then there's nothing you can do on your end that's going to make it better because the traffic already reached your, your router or your firewall or whatever, and you're just blocking it there. It can flood the, the networks up to that point. And... It can have an impact that's not directly related to what it's targeting. If you can cause the, the email server CPU usage to spike, it will affect the web server that's running on the same machine without ever trying to attack the web server directly. 
So yep. sometimes it's different. It's difficult to, to identify the reason why something is slow or not responsive. And it might not be the thing that's directly being attacked, but it's still being subject to denial of service. It's just an indirect one. Yep. I completely agree with you. So, yeah, that's uh, not the most um, happy ending I think we've ever had in an episode, but um, we have to be honest. We're not going to sugarcoat anything or, or build someone up to think something's easy when it's not. It's definitely a good example, a good example, an example of why an this example. is so egregious, <laughs> of why it's you know skyrocketing, the numbers are going up. And I think one of the biggest takeaways here is this article, like you mentioned, is evidence that this isn't getting better it's getting worse and there's going to be a point in the future where we're going to think of this looking back as a really small ddos compared to what's out there at that time sometime in the future as much as i hate to say that but again um, we'll have this episode as well to look back on and yeah I'm especially worried about amplification type attacks because DNS and LDAP were not the only ones that could be abused this way. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the next one might be even more impactful, might have Im even more traffic directed to a victim and the numbers will undoubtedly get bigger. The trend is just, I mean, it's obvious that the, the amount of traffic, the amount of request number is just getting larger and larger with each one. And the speed yep. with which it's accelerating, it's massive. I mean, it almost doubled in six months and it had never doubled like that before. So if the next one doubles in six months, even we're going to be seeing like really, really, really big sites being potentially being taken down with something like this. Is this what so. Moore's law has become? <laughs> yeah. <No>. <laughs> yeah, rather <laughs> rather than computational power it's the amount of the dos power that you can point like, at the victim yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> it's scaling accordingly to moore's law at least so yeah let's yeah, see how it goes parallel i i yeah just just noticed i'm like wait a minute moore's law isn't as dead as i thought <laughs> <laughs> That's a different yeah. debate. I'm not going to get into that. So Yeah, and before I'm called out on this, when I say it's scaling like Moore's Law, I didn't go back and look if it's scaling like Moore's Law. It appears to be because the attacks are doubling and the time is having, is halving. So let's see if it continues that way. But very likely it will. Completely agree. All right. So that was our episode for today. Thank you, everybody who joined. As always, it was a pleasure and see you on the next one. See you guys later. Bye.